So economics can solve small problems. Economics can also solve or make sense of big problems. Uh, so when it comes to something like climate change, a lot of people seem to believe, at least until Nick Stern came along, that economists just don't understand environmental problems, uh, which, is, which is a shame, because the, in a way the first environmentalist was also one of the early economists, Thomas Malthus. And we all say, you know, it's on page one of all these textbooks that we use, economics is the study of scarce resources. Well, well sure, environmentalism is, is about nothing other than scarce resources. So surely there must be some way of, of these subjects talking to each other. And, so we, and we know this. So, so the question is making those connections, showing how markets that economists have designed can be used to, to uh, trade carbon permits, talking about the pros and cons of those carbon markets. Uh, or, or, I mean, this is a huge, a, a, a huge exercise in cost-benefit analysis, in discounting. If you try to pick, pick apart the Stern Review, there's an excellent, excellent review of the review in the Journal of Economic Literature uh, by the name will come to me in a second. Um, the, if, if you take students through something like the Stern Review and you, you question the assumptions and you show, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this, you, you're really, you're giving them a, a, a masterclass in cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. Here's, here's how he got his results. Here's, how, here's the discounting. Here's the weighting for inequality. Um, here's the allowance for uncertainty. Oh, there's no allowance for uncertainty. Okay, well that's interesting. Uh, given that this is one of the most uncertain problems the world faces, what do we do about that? Or another example, foreign aid. Uh, I was obsessed with the problem of development when I was a student, uh, I think I still am. Uh, students today think it's one of the most important issues facing the world. You have the popularity of Live Aid, you have campaigns, I'm wearing, I'm wearing my red trainers, <coughs> Bono says I'm okay, you've got fair trade coffee, you've got drop the debt, uh, you've got all of these different approaches to foreign aid, all these different approaches to development. And yet I don't remember when I studied economics for one minute addressing the problem of development. And this seems to me a central economic problem. Uh, and what you don't need to sell the importance of the problem to students. They know this is an important problem. And, and again, just trying to explore the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches to foreign aid teaches you so much about economics. So a great example, about eight years ago, uh, Donner and Cray published their study of whether aid works. And the conclusion you might recall, if you, if you follow this sort of thing, you will certainly have heard of the paper, is aid works in a good policy environment. And it was based on a uh, regression analysis, cross-country statistical analysis, of about 50 countries. And they showed that when countries received aid and they had a good policy environment, defined in a certain way, set out in the paper, they grew more after they received the aid. And when countries received aid and they didn't have a good policy environment, they didn't grow. Uh, and that, that paper was tremendously influential. It was tremendously influential for one reason, which is that this is exactly what the aid community wanted to hear. I mean, that's, they, they keep telling Africa to improve the policy environment, um, and you know, we'll send the aid, and then the aid will work. So I'm not saying the paper was wrong. I'm just saying it was, it was received very well because it was the message that people were, were looking out for. Now, that's a, that paper is a great starting point for examining development and examining the assumptions. So, you can examine the way that economists have a dialogue over their hypotheses. So you look at Bill Easterly's criticism of the dollar and Craig paper, and you discover that he extends the data set by a few years and by a few countries, and the effect completely disappears. That's fascinating. That's a fascinating under uh, way of understanding the way that economic statistics <laughs> work. Or you can start picking apart the assumptions. So how come we have a paper that asks questions about the policy environment, but doesn't ask questions about the aid? And that's, that's a very interesting question. And since then, we've had more and more papers starting to say, well, hang on, maybe it isn't the policy environment we should be looking at. Maybe it's the quality of the aid. Maybe there's good aid and maybe there's bad aid. And there's a lot of work out there. So one of the, one of the pieces of research I think is, is very important um, for students to study, but I think it's very important for us all to understand, is the, the work by the MIT Poverty Action Lab. It's very accessible, very, very interesting work, easy to grasp what they were doing. 
and I think shows some of the, the new techniques in economics. The basic idea is, well, you want to know whether aid works. Okay, let's, let's choose a specific aid project. Here's a specific aid project. We're going to give textbooks to schools in Kenya. That's, that's an aid project. What would, so now we have to ask some important questions. What, what, what would success look like? You know, if that project worked, what would we expect? Well, you know, we'd expect maybe the kids did better at school. They did better on their test scores. So then you go, okay, fine. Well, why don't we give textbooks to half the schools in Kenya and not give textbooks to the other half? And what's more, we won't choose the schools based on uh, who has the best connections to Nairobi or who has the headmaster or headmistress who's most engaged, who's most, who's most interested, who's most ambitious, uh, which would be the normal way that aid projects were selected. We're going to do it on a randomised, controlled basis, the way that uh, a pharmaceutical company would test a new drug. And you do that, you come back in a year's time, having handed out books at random to some Kenyan schools and, and no books at random to other Kenyan schools, and you see whether the test scores have improved. And the answer is they haven't. Now that, to me, it might sound like failure to you, to me that sounds like a tremendous success. We learn something very important. So the next year, they go back, they say, well maybe, uh, maybe the problem was that actually most of the kids couldn't read, and perhaps if the teachers had uh, whiteboards they could write on, that, that would help. Maybe that would make all the difference. So then the next year, they went back, they did the same thing with whiteboards. Again, they randomised, again they came back, and still nothing. Another apparent failure, for me, another success. The third year, they went back and they handed out worming tablets. Because they realised that a lot of the kids had tapeworm, damaging their nutrition, they got sick, they couldn't concentrate, they didn't go to school. The worming tablets are much cheaper than the textbooks, by the way. They hand those out, they come back in a year, massive success. And then they try to, they try to roll that out, so they take the same project to India, where tapeworm is not such a problem, but iron deficiency is a problem, and instead of the, the tapeworm tablets, they're handing out iron supplements. And again, they found a big success. Now, that sort of exploration in, in little tiny steps, I think, is the way that a lot of economics is going. It's the way a lot of development is going. And it's the way that things should go. But there's absolutely no relation to anything I ever saw in a textbook. Because naturally, the way that we think in our textbooks is we set out the mathematics of the model and we solve it. And there's, there's a very, very good reason for doing that. Yeah, we're, we're thinking rigorously, we're thinking clearly, we're setting out our assumptions, we're showing what might or might not be possible. But there's also a risk in doing that. There's the risk we all recognise, which is the students get confused, they don't like maths, they think it's hard. But there's another risk, which is that it implies that the economy is something that you can solve. So you, as long as you're good enough at the maths, when you've finished, you have the answer. And that, I think, is a misconception about the way the economy works. I'm not saying throw out the maths. But we have, to, we have to explain to our students that actually real economics can't ever work quite like that. And at the same time, that you've given this little hint of joy that, you know, maybe there's more to life than these equations they have to keep solving. <laughs> so there's a good news story out there. 